Welcome everyone to the Directed IRA podcast with Mark Holler and Matt Sorensen. We're excited to be here today talking about leveraging your IRA. How is about, that kind of a, don't... is that a weight room thing? We're going to, yes, kind of le- we're going to lift things. We're going <laughs> to, yeah, leverage uh, is like, leverage. we're talking about debt. Mm. Like, I don't want my IRA to go in debt. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't hear Dave Ramsey talk about, let's leverage something. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's a good topic to begin with first is what, why does this even make sense? I think that's a fair question too, but true. You know, true. I um, think it's, I think we hit a couple easy, easy questions on that, but um, this is an important topic. A lot of people leverage their IRA or 401k or HSA to go buy an, a, an investment property or other asset. And so we want to go through the rules on how it works, make sure you know the details. And then um, also talk about some of just, the traps and tricks maybe to get um, around some of these traps. Tricks. <laughs> yep. Some strategies to get around traps and tricks. Yeah. Um, then, and let's get this right out for all of you that are um, maybe new to self-directing. And thank you for making this podcast in a, a, a regular, we hope, a regular podcast you <laughs> listen to. We want you to make so much money in your retirement accounts and uh, have a better lifestyle and a better... Um, financial picture for the future because of self-directing. And that's what this podcast is all about. So welcome if you're new. And for those of you that are seasoned, uh, we hope to add some, maybe some technical strategies today that you've maybe never thought of. We always try to bring something new. But for all of you that are new to this, here's a basic example. When we say leverage, you want to buy a $150,000 rental property. You only have 75,000 in an IRA. Can you do it? Yes. Most, <laughs> most can banks, he do it? Yes, we can. Or, or yeah. yes, he can. Or what's that? Yes, we can. And so what that would generally look like is you would get a loan for 50% of the property and put down your cash of the other 50. Now that's just in general. We'll get into reserves and what banks are typically looking for as down payments. They're typically doing a 40, 60 loan, but they want you to have 50% or another 10% yeah. there is reserves. So I kind of use that 50-50. We'll, we'll get a better number here. I probably chose yeah. the wrong numbers example. But the point yeah. is, your IRA can go get a loan and buy a rental that cash flows and do it with savvy, smart investment principles. Getting into mm-hmm. debt to buy a rental is okay. And maybe we start there, Matt. Do you think it's okay? Yeah. I mean, do you have a rental with debt? I mean, Absolutely. All my rentals have debt <laughs> in my retirement account, which I do have a, a property in my retirement account, LLC that has debt in my personal side, all the real estate I have has debt on it. And of course, why would I do that? And I, you know, you can increase the purchasing power. It increases your rate of return. Just think of like that example, Mark gave. Let's say you did have a $150,000 account. So you could have bought the property outright with cash. Well, if I got a mortgage, maybe I could buy two. Yeah. Would you rather have the cash flow of two properties, right? We can have some mortgage, some debt expense. Would you rather have the cash flow on two properties, the appreciation on two properties, or just one? And so I think um, uh, that's a common question I've had with clients is, I have enough cash to buy it outright, but maybe I buy two or three properties instead of similar, you know, let's say single family homes, or I buy a bigger property than I otherwise could have, and I use some debt. It's math. Just run the numbers. If you look at the appreciation you get, you know, you get basically more, the the more properties you have, the more appreciation you have, you just have this cost of the debt. So you got to run the numbers. I love it. I'm going to actually, while we're talking about this topic, so many of you don't think I'm writing down my list for the grocery store after the podcast, I'm going to write down (laughs) a couple examples that exemplify that greater ROI of using leverage uh, with an IRA. I'll write down a couple examples and maybe we can uh, show them on a whiteboard. I'll give you plenty of time, Corey, here to throw it up on our screen if, screen if we go for that. But um, I'm, I maybe I'll do a couple little examples here while we're talking. Um, and I want to say something on the theory that is anti-Dave Ramsey, if one can <laughs> boldly say that, because I love Dave Ramsey and what he's done. He really has. He's saved the lives of millions of Americans. Um, I'm more out of debt today because of Dave Ramsey. What a cool legacy that he's left. Yeah. You know, 
That's just yep. cool. But I think Dave Ramsey goes a little far when he says you should never, ever, ever have debt, even if it's a rental. I think that's that's a bad thing. And I'll show some numbers why. So here's my principle, if I could talk all of you into this, is that there's bad debt and good debt. Bad debt is obviously on the extreme, a credit card to go on a cruise. You know, you don't have the money, you didn't save up to go, but you really wanted to go, so you throw it on a credit card, and then who knows what else could hit on that credit card. You know, your tires go flat, you have a, a medical emergency or whatever, and all of a sudden you're in debt up to your eyeballs with credit cards. You could start talking about auto loans and buy, over buying vehicles or student debt for a degree that's not going to produce enough income. Anyway, we get into these areas of bad debt pretty quickly, but good debt makes you money. Um, in fact, Matt, it's interesting. I was listening to a professor, gosh, it was years ago, and that taught that in Wall Street, when they're, when you look at the stock price of a company, a company that has no debt actually is valued less because Wall Street says, you know what? You could be using your resources more strategically yeah. by going into a little debt to make more money and to grab more market share. Debt is good. Debt is healthy when it makes you money. And mm -hmm. companies that have the right amount of debt are yeah. valued higher. Now, you have too much debt, company value comes down. So there's a sweet spot there. And I think your IRAs can do it too. Yeah, and I think on the non-recourse loans, and by the way, that's the type of loan you have to get. When you got, get debt on an IRA, it's got to be this quote-unquote non-recourse loan. Define that. And, what that, and yeah. what that means is basically you don't guarantee the loan. You're not signing on it. So if Matt Sorensen's IRA is buying a property or my LLC, my IRA is the borrower or my IRA-owned LLC is the borrower, but I'm not personally guaranteeing that in the event of default. If, if, if my IRA defaults on that, the bank that loaned the money can foreclose and take the property back to pay themselves back, but they can't go after the IRA for more. They can't come after me personally. And so that's a non-recourse loan for retirement accounts. And there's a lot of banks that offer those loans that go after those real estate rental properties um, and, and have a non-recourse loan product. We have a list on our strategic resources um, page on the Directed IRA website. We can go look up some of those banks. Okay. And yeah, they're going to have the requirements Mark mentioned. It's going to be 30%. There's one now that's doing 25%, by the way. Really? So there's kind of like, yep, 30 to 40% down typically is what you, you're going to see on most of the banks. There's probably about six or seven banks now that do these non-recourse loans. And now before you go to percentages, and I, you're right, Matt, you caught me pausing there because I was writing down some examples here. But back on the non-recourse, let me give another example. You don't have to go to a bank either. You maybe yeah. you're... Maybe your great uncle or your rich grandma or whatever, depending on prohibited transaction rules, you might be able to borrow from a neighbor or whatever. And these are called in the industry, a private loan. So someone mm -hmm. says, hey, you want to, I've got a property. You can have a first trust deed. I'll give you 8%. Maybe the banks are doing four or five, but it's easier. You go to a private yeah. lender and they say, yeah, I'll give you 60% loan to value. And it's a private loan. That's now, when they say, I want a personal guarantee, you're like, nope, can't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> my IRA is involved. I can't do it. Yeah. Here's another one is just some, the, you know, real estate investors doing creative terms and getting seller financing or buying a property subject to existing debt. Yeah. As long as they don't personally guarantee it themselves, you know, usually you're going to use an IRA LLC in that example. So the LLC is the borrower and there can be a lien, you know, a mortgage or deed of trust on the property. That's okay. Um, but you could also just be doing seller financing. Yeah. Do you, now I know we, Matt and I try to be a little cautious here, sharing too many of our personal lives, but um, <laughs> you've got a rental in Minneapolis, right? Indianapolis. Indian, same thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, <but> Annapolis. <laughs> there's an Annapolis in there somewhere. Um, and it, so I have a, a rental in Chicago in my HSA and I'll share what I feel comfortable saying here, but on my HSA rental property, it was seller financing. I yeah. put down 5% with an HSA, bought a low income housing property with seller mm -hmm. financing. Did you, if, do you mind sharing in Indianapolis? What kind of loan did you get for your IRA? Yeah. So I had an LLC of course, and that owned by my retirement account, which is actually my 401k, but it owns an LLC and the LLC got the loan. I used um, first Western federal 
savings bank. They're they're one of the ones on our website. Like I said, there's about six, but they are myiralender.com. Um, but, but they, um, you know, I've just used them. They spoke at the self-directed IRA summit. And so, um, so, but they, yeah, the loans to the LLC, if the LLC doesn't pay the, the, the mortgage, they could foreclose and take the property back, but they ain't coming after Matt Sorensen. They're not going after my 401k. Okay. So those are examples of a non-recourse loan and you can use banks or private lenders, whatever. Could I loan, could I loan my IRA the money myself, Matt? <laughs> Throwing you a soft <laughs> No, no, no. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> now that'd be prohibited. That's go back to our podcast episodes on prohibited transactions. You can't transact with yourself or, you know, your IRA. So that would violate the rules. But, you know, another third party, another real estate investor. There's even some private money lenders we see on clients that are using their retirement account to buy and sell property that the private money lenders will do non-recourse. And so usually what you're going to see, whether it's a bank, a private money lender, um, they're going to want to see that the IRA has got some skin in the game. They want something down on this. If there's no guarantees, you know, they want to see that you've got some skin in the game. Even the banks are like, and this better be an income producing property. Like they want to loan on rental. Yeah. They want to know that you're going to rent this out and they're going to look at the rental income. They're going to do an appraisal of the property. But what they're not going to do is consider your credit. Now, some of the banks will pull your credit, but they don't care about your credit score, frankly. They're looking at it to make sure you're not in bankruptcy or something like that where they could get sucked in because um, your IRA can sometimes get sucked in. And so, uh, so they want to know that you don't have, that's usually why they're pulling it. But your credit score, there's no credit score requirements or anything. Okay. Now, let's see. We talked about the concept of using debt. We talked about what leveraging means and a non-recourse loan. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get another kind of strategy on the table. Um, we can't use ourselves to loan, and we've got yeah. the prohibited transaction podcast that'll let you know who could loan or who couldn't, uh, could or couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, now, let's say I, I get a loan on a property to buy the property one and I was just talking to someone yesterday that is was talking about just all the cash offers competition out there so if and that can be a challenge you say well I want my IRA to buy a rental I make an offer oh I'm number 15 offer and there's 10 <laughs> cash offers in front of me you're like yeah. this is never going to happen so could I make a cash offer out of my IRA buy a property and then take out a first mortgage or a private lender or bank and pull out 60%. It's not a refi. Yeah. It's kind of a first, but it's after the purchase. What do you think? Absolutely. And not a lot of those non-recourse lenders that are on the site, again, at directedarea.com, go to resources. Um, we have a section for non-recourse lenders. Yes, many of those banks will do refis. I've even seen clients, you know, who use one lender. Rates have gone down and they are the same or thing. They refi to another non-recourse loan at a lower rate. Absolutely possible. Okay. So, so the now I've got that cash back, but where's that cash going? Well, it's going to my IRA LLC or back into my IRA. So yeah. I can go buy more investment assets, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's now w the, the big reveal here, everybody, <laughs> it's going to be probably the, the climax of this podcast is this UDFI conversation which is called unrelated debt financed income. What do I have? Is there a drawback to all this? Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no. It depends on if you're doing this in an IRA or 401k. We'll come to that in a moment. So if that's the big reveal at the end, let's think, is there anything else practically that can occur in a leverage strategy before we get to UDFI? What do you see, Matt, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I mean, you could do multi-member IRA LLCs. We've seen that multiple IRAs and individuals in an LLC getting a non-recourse loan for maybe a bigger property. Um, I've seen clients buy agricultural property that they lease out and get rental income on. This isn't just single family rentals. There's non-recourse lenders that we worked with and deals we see here of people buying like, you know, like a family dollar or like these single tenant, smaller commercial properties. There's non-recourse lenders that love lending on those. Um, so don't just think it's just the little, you know, single family rental market where you can leverage your retirement account with debt. We see it at all different types of real estate. The only thing the banks really want here in the end is they want it, the property to be appraised, of course, for in their lending requirements. 
and then they want it to know the, the rental income that it's going to generate that'll cover the debt um, payments and certain upkeep and maintenance that they're going to create a formula for when looking at it. Okay. Um, I think that's a fair point. Let's hit a little practical. I've got two topics. I think yeah. you'll love Matt. Let's just hit. Yeah, we got to hit UDFI one. for sure. And I, but the good thing on UDFI is there's a lot of tricks. That's where yeah. the, that's where the strategies can, you know, be yeah. useful and helpful. All right. So here's a couple other base hits before we get to UDFI. One is, uh, that I like is, let's say you've got a rental property, uh, in your IRA, and all of a sudden it needs a new roof. Or it needs some money. Yeah. You've had a bad tenant. You've had a problem. And this could be some of you listening today where you're like, ugh, I don't want to sell the property, but I need more cash in the project. Um, I, if I can't do an additional contribution. I just don't have enough in my IRA that started the project. Um, can I go get a loan at that point? We've already said yes. You can get a loan down the road. Now, this, I'm going to put Matt to the challenge. He's, this is in his book, and I don't know the reference. So I'm going to ask you, Matt. There is an exception to an exception to get out of jail free card scenario where you could actually loan to your IRA LLC in a dire strait and the IRS isn't going to yeah. throw you in jail. It, that, that would be a form of non-recourse lending. And it's the one time you can get around the prohibited rule. Do we want do you, do you mind mentioning that? Should we or not? What's the, <laughs> yeah. what's the urban legend on that? Is it true? Do you even recommend yeah, it? It's, um, I believe it's Primitive Transaction Exemption 80-26. See, I know you knew that. Um, but it's in my book. Um, so if you need to find that. But this is what it's for. It's not to go buy a new asset. It's not, okay. oh, I'm going to loan my IRA money so I can go buy a rental property. No, it's for, actually, I'm going to lose this rental property. There's a pending foreclosure. This property actually has value. For whatever reason, I didn't get it sold or whatever. I could loan my retirement account money to basically save the asset and save the, the money and you know investments I've made in my retirement account. And so if, if it's kind of an emergency situation, um, you are able to loan money. Now, um, I've maybe, I can count on one hand the number of clients that have done that in my 16 years of doing this. Um, so it's, it's rare, but it's a possibility. It is out there. Okay. Um, all right. And then I guess practically speaking, just talk about who pays the mortgage. This is where I think the LLC comes into play. Any of you that want to go buy a rental property in the name of your IRA, in fact, uh, I, oh my gosh. I, I, okay, a little practical example here. This was one of the employees in our office that said, hey, I met this friend that bought a rental with their IRA. I want to try to keep mm -hmm. this private so I won't say who the employee was and of course not who this person was. And they said, and I go, oh, well, What's the issue? Well, they want to refinance or they want to do something. And I go, well, tell me about the LLC. Oh, they don't have an LLC. I go, they don't. They did a non-recourse mm -hmm. loan with an IRA without an LLC and they have a loan. Who's managing this thing? Well, they are. I go, out of what checkbook? Oh, he just has a regular checkbook. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so this thing just went from yeah. bad to worse. <laughs> and I said, Run Forest Run. This is this. He really should just sell the property and start over. There's prohibited transactions all over. We can't fix yeah. it. But the point was is they should have really used an LLC to begin with, and yeah. that's who pays the more. Maybe give us a practical example of how you have debt that pay and how you pay for it. You know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Because you know when you buy a rental property, you're going to have expenses, and when you buy a rental property with debt, <laughs> you definitely have expenses, right? The bank is going to want to check every month. So. Um, what most real estate clients do is an IRA LLC. Rather than their IRA buying the property directly, they have their IRA own an LLC 100%. And you could do it differently. You could have partners and have different, but the most common is just IRA owns the LLC 100%. LLC in turn owns the property. Now you can be the manager of the LLC. The LLC is going to have a business checking account. The IRA's cash is going to get invested in the LLC. The LLC is going to buy the property. The LLC is going to own it. The LLC is going to get the non-recourse loan. The LLC is going to receive the rent. The LLC is going to pay the mortgage and other expenses on the property. And so some people call that checkbook control, but it's a nice way to one, have more control of the expenses, including the debt payment expenses. Also, it's nice just to cover, you know, remodel things or exp other expenses you may have on the property. And you also have an LLC for some liability protection too. So 
Now there's one other model you could do, which is have the IRA own it outright, but then you're gonna need a property manager, like at least, because who is gonna receive the rent? Who is gonna pay the bills every week? Do you really wanna run that through your IRA custodian all the time? Um, and we do have clients that have their IRAs. I mean, I've got hundreds, not thousands of accounts here. We, we have them that their IRA owns real estate directly without an LLC, but almost all of them, in fact, I believe all of them have a property manager that receives the income that pays the bills. And quite honestly, that property manager is a lot more than an LLC, <laughs> but, um, but you could go, that would be the only other route. You controlling the IRA and not having a property manager or an LLC and having a mortgage, that is, I don't like that structure. I think you're going to run into problems and or it's otherwise just creating a lot of administrative headache. Yeah. No, I love it. Um, okay. So everybody, you probably know now how you could use leverage, how you pay for it, how you deal with it, <laughs> what it's like, <laughs> why do it. Um, I want to go to the whiteboard here at the end of the presentation, Corey. So if you'll help me when that get start to prepare for that, but Matt, why don't you tell us what this UDFI problem is? If you're going to get debt, What's the basic yeah. <laughs> problem? Then we can yeah. talk about how to get around it. So, yeah. So, okay. okay. There, the UDFI, that's one of these four letter words in the IRA vocabulary. <laughs> um, it stands for unrelated debt financed income. And basically, it's a tax that the IRS has to say, hey, you want to buy more investment assets with debt? We'll let you do it as long as it's non recourse, but you better, um, pay us tax on the profits you make from the debt because the debt wasn't retirement account dollars. So you got to pay tax on the profits from the debt. The best way to understand it is an example. Okay. Let's walk through the example of buying a property with your IRA for $100,000. And I know, you know, to many of you in your real estate market, that's so unreasonable now, but I can do the math on this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We got a hundred thousand dollar purchase price. Let's say 40,000 of that is from the IRA. The IRA puts in the cash. You had 40 grand in the IRA. The other 60,000 comes from a non-recourse loan. This is a mortgage. There's debt on your property. When the IRS looks at that, they're like, all right, 40% of what you put in here is retirement plan dollars. The other 60% is debt. Let's say you make, after expenses and everything you can write off, let's say you make $10,000 in rental income and cash flow. The IRS says on that 10,000, 60% of that is income attributed to the debt. So $6,000 there is income attributed to the debt, which is where this UDFI tax gets applied. The other 4,000 of that 10, don't worry, there's no tax on it. This is IRA. But that 6,000, you're going to have this UDFI tax on it. Okay. Now, that's okay. It's Now, this is a point I want to make first, and we're going to tell you a couple ways to get around that here yeah in two and i'll seconds. hit the tax rates too unless you want yeah. me to hit the tax rates now well let me say this in general first okay. before you do that i want to hit a concept point because there's a couple real estate groups out there that drive me crazy and i can't say i'm here on our podcast fear of a lawsuit <laughs> and defamation <laughs> truly or i would tell you i wish i could warn you yeah but the truth is a defense so but let's still not it's not worth the hassle. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> truth is a defense but so what happens is there's some groups out there that say, because of this UDFI, you shouldn't use leverage. And I'm, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, just because there might be some tax, before you even get to the strategies of how to get around it, just because there might be some tax, don't use leverage. And they'll even go as far to say, don't even buy rentals in your retirement account because you don't get the pass-through loss that you might get when you buy personal rentals. So you know what? The whole thing's a farce, and they literally package it up in this way of fear and say, don't buy rentals with an IRA because of UDFI and because you don't get the loss. It's a waste. Let's go buy something else. And I'm like, what? How did you get there? It's just that's yeah. crazy talk. And so I just want to assure everybody this is not the end of the world. It's just another cost to put into your yeah. equation. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the first thing to think about is, in that example, you had a $40,000 IRA. You could have only bought an asset and get return on investment on a $40,000 investment if you didn't get debt. You just more than doubled your investment purchasing power and the asset that you can get a return on investment for to a $100,000 investment asset. And so 
there's going to be more benefits. There's huge benefits, obviously, to doing that. Let's not just take into account the con of this UDFI. Now, let me hit a couple points on the tax rate on this. This is not that bad. On cash flow, let's just say it was $10,000 after all your expenses, you had $10,000 in taxable income. That's 37%. You go from zero to 37%. Well, that sucks. I know. Most of you, though, on your rentals, and we see them here in our office, they're cash flowing, but not on paper, not for tax purposes, because this is where you can use depreciation to offset income. So the depreciation expense on the property you can use to offset this UDFI income, which puts many of you at a loss. So a lot of clients that have single family rentals that are cash flowing aren't paying any UDFI tax year to year because of the depreciation expense they get a pass. And yep. Um, a, and a couple other thoughts is on this. Well, when I go to sell, uh, you may have already paid off the debt. You may have retired the debt from some by refinancing another IRA property. And as long as you've been debt free on the IRA property for 12 months, you can sell it UDFI free. And yep. we also have the 401k exception. Oh, yeah. This is like. This is a golden nugget, as we call it in Matt's book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, let's say let I don't hit, want... Let me, before we get to the 401k, let me hit that one on the, the that's a good one on the, once retirement. you pay off the debt and you have 12 months of no debt, see, when you sell a property, the IRS wants to know, right when you sell it, they're going to look back 12 months and they're going to say, what was the average debt over the prior 12 months before this property sold? That's the leverage ratio they're going to apply on the entire game. Even if you own that property for 10 or 15 years, 20 years, where you've paid down the mortgage over time, they only care about the debt percent of the last 12 months on the gain. Now, if you paid it off and held it and you're just paying down debt, that's awesome. Another strategy, and I've had a lot of clients do this, they'll go get an investor to joint venture with them. Mm. And, and that investor will come in with the JV agreement or they buy a little bit of the LLC. and they get, let's say, 5% profit equity participation in the deal. They know the property is going to be selling in a year and the, the other person plans to do that. But their money comes in as equity in a partnership scenario, pays off the debt, then they hold it for 12 months with no debt and UDFI does not apply to the gain at all. And you so, may say, well, I've got to pay my equity partner. Well, paying your equity partner 5% of the profit is better than yeah. paying UDFI of yeah. X percent. And yeah. And the, so. and on UDFI, just when you sell a property, you do get the long-term capital gain rate max of 20%. So that's nice. Um, so if you do ha end up having to pay it on the sell, it's on the, the average debt you had over the prior 12 months. And um, again, it's, uh, it's only a max of 20%. So if you do get stuck with it at the end of the day, it's not that bad. It's only on the debt piece. And remember, you were able to leverage and get a much larger investment asset than you otherwise could have. Love it. All right. Now, do you want a little interlude here with some mm -hmm. numbers of a typical deal and cash on okay. cash ROI, or should we go to the 401k and wrap it up with a bow? You choose. I mean, I like an interlude. Who doesn't okay. like an interlude? Yeah. <laughs> intermission. Intermission. Whatever. Okay. Inter something. Okay. So, so our intermission interlude, this is great. Uh, we'll come back to the, the 401k strategy. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to kind of put a bow around this topic. This is this is pretty cool. Using debt in an IRA and looking at the cash on cash ROI. This is where some naysayers out there say, oh, you should never put, you know, real estate in an IRA because you don't get the pass through losses. And then they'll even add insult to injury and go, well, you might have unrelated debt financed income. And we've got all sorts of ways, as we've talked about here on the show, to get around that. So let's set those aside for a minute and let's just look at cash on cash ROI and why leverage makes sense. So Matt, I've got some numbers for you. you excited? I love it. Okay. Okay. All right. So this we're going to look the at the accountant in you that I love when it comes out every once in a while. Yes. Letting them out. Math and <laughs> <laughs> letting them out of the cage here. All right. So here we have everybody, the same property for 300 grand. Now let's say this is after purchase price costs and any improvements, you know, we're taking some, we want to just compare apples to apples. I know there's a lot of moving parts in it you know, an acquisition and what's going to end up on the books. But let's just, you know, so we have some easy numbers here. $300,000 property. With this one on the left, we're going to go without debt. We're just going to buy a rental in our IRA without debt. 
Now we talked about you could do this in a HSA, you could do it with a 401k and a Roth, the traditional, any sort of retirement account. I can go out and buy a rental. Typically we're gonna do that in an LLC. It's gonna be easier to manage mm -hmm. the property and create some asset protection for you as the manager of the, not the property itself, but just involved, we want some asset protection. So all sorts of great topics Please continue to listen to our podcast or the prior podcast on those. <laughs> okay, this other one we're going to use with debt, all right? We've got our Dave Ramsey crowd giving us a little leeway here. This is good debt. This is not bad mm -hmm. debt. This debt's going to make us money. So let's do the first one. Let's say, and I think everybody out there, you can live with a 1% rent to value at, uh, ratio. So that means we take 1% of the purchase price. We're hoping to get three grand in rent. So we've got 36 grand a year in rent. That's 3,000 a month times 12. Yeah. And I was gonna say, let's just look at expenses. Now we're looking at direct, we wanna get to cash on cash, return on investment, cash on cash ROI. I love that. If I have a hundred grand in, put it in the bank and I get a 2% CD, they're gonna give me two grand at the end of the year. That's two grand in cash against a hundred thousand dollar investment, cash on cash ROI. So let's say I've got 500 a month in direct expenses, property taxes, property management, you know, who knows what. If I do a 10% property management fee, that'd be 360 a month. And that would be $6,000 a year in expenses. But you know what? Let's even be a little more realistic. Let's say it's 10 grand. I got 10 grand a year in expenses, direct expenses, property taxes, HOA, property management, whatever. So what did I net? I netted 26 grand. That's pretty much it. There's no tax. Mm -hmm. It's in my IRA. I made $26,000 on a $300,000 investment. What is my cash on cash ROI? So if I take 26 grand and divide it by 300 grand, I'm going to end up with 8.6% ROI. Not bad. Right. Not okay. Now, probably better than the stock market, but, but could be very better than ETF or you know, stock market. Yeah. Now, let's say I get 5% appreciation. The property goes up 5% in value. So next year, the property is worth $315,000. That's 5% of $300,000. Well, what does that turn in due to my ROI? Now, that's not cash on cash. That'd be another matrix quadrant that we love to talk about, appreciation. And I've got to sell the property and their selling costs. I get all that. But let's just say it's 5% appreciation. Well, that's pretty easy. You take 5% appreciation on... 300 grand, it's it's a straight it's a straight shot. So that's 5% return. My investment's 300 grand. There's there's no leverage. So you no leverage yeah. people. So I've now got a 13.6% return. Now this is why I love buying real estate in an IRA. Mm -hmm. What the hell? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. That's cash special. flow and appreciation. Yeah. No, there's no UDFI down the road. I've got yep. selling costs. I get it, but that's pretty good. That's not chump change, you know? Yep. Like okay. It. Now, let's say I use leverage. All right. Now, as Matt has discussed here, we could, some banks may allow us to put down 25%, 30%, 60%, 40, you know, all sorts of banks. We have my, uh, private lenders. What I went with was a 40% down payment, which okay, would be I like it. Okay. Fairly conservative. That's 120 yep. grand. So, I now have a hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan, so I can. You're already seeing the writing on the wall, people. That's a hundred eighty grand of someone else's money, OPM, other people's money. So that that means I can go invest that hundred eighty on day three here in a minute. Just keep yeah. this in the back of your mind. Maybe I'll use that somewhere else. Yeah, you down um, with OPM? I, I love OPM. Yeah, you know me. I mean, come on. <laughs> You down with OPP? You don't remember that one? No. Yeah, you know me? No? Oh, oh come on. You're, you're younger than me. That's, uh, that's before my time. All right. <laughs> or after my time. <laughs> at some time. <laughs> that ain't the time. <laughs> All right. Now, let's compare apples to apples. So, we have 36 grand in rent. It's 10 grand in expenses. I net 26 grand. Oh, but Mark, you got a mortgage payment in there. Okay. So, I got to take that cash off the table because I got to pay that mortgage payment. Now, I just ran the math here during our podcast. I came up with $1,138 per 
mortgage payment. I think it was a 6% interest rate. And if you'll just give me a little latitude, everybody, it could have been lower, higher, whatever. You're saying, well, I got to get a commercial loan because it's an IRA, whatever, just chill. Okay, so let's just say I came up with this loan of $1,138 a month. That's approximately $13,000 a year. So I'm going to take out $13,000 in cash off the table. It's gone. Now, yes, it's paying down the mortgage. It's another ROI, but we're not going to worry about that today. We're just dealing with cash on cash. So now my IRA is only getting $13,000 in cash. Now, the novice investor would go, oh, I get twenty-six dollars here. I get thirteen dollars here. Twenty-six dollars is bigger. That must be better. I am not going to use leverage. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, is the appreciation different? Nope. Appreciation is the same. Ooh, we'll come back to that. Okay. Do I get all of it? Right. Yeah, yeah. So before we get to appreciation, look at well, thirteen grand is less, so that must be bad. Oh, we got to do the math. Thirteen grand is divided by your investment of one hundred and twenty. So what is my return on my investment? You didn't invest three hundred grand; you invested one hundred and twenty. So when I take that thirteen grand and divide it by one hundred and twenty grand, ooh, that's a 10 point, or no, 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 I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, I've got 12.5 down here and 10 point. Oh, that's a 10.8 rate, rate or 10.8%. Oh my gosh, let's get our, got to make my uh, little diagram here look pretty. Okay, <laughs> here we go. That's a 10.8% ROI. That is a big deal. So when I compare 10.8% to 8.6%, I'm making 3% more because of leverage. But according to Ginsu Knives, it gets better. because <laughs> There's more. Yeah, there's more. Because let's go back to appreciation. If we're going to really compare this, I get the same 5% appreciation. So the property is going to go up in 15, 000, by $15,000 on paper. We know we got to sell it down the road, but we're going to compare apples to apples. So that 5% appreciation, oh, we should just add that 5% to 10.8. Oh, no, no. You made $15,000 more on three hundred grand using OPM, other people's money. So $15,000 divided by one hundred and twenty grand is now a 12.5% return, not 5%. When we add this up, the whole package there is 23.3%. Mm. Ooh. So I like now- I of that. Yeah, I'm comparing 23.3 to 13.6. Now the leverage is even looking better. And we're not done yet. It gets better <laughs> because I still get to go out and invest that 180 grand. So if I can go out and make 20% on the 180 grand, oh my gosh. I just made another $36,000 that I wouldn't get in option A. So I'm getting a 23.3% return on my on my 120 grand plus I got another 180 to go invest and get who knows what. This yeah. is how rich people get richer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Debt is a tool. It yes. can hurt you if you use it wrong, but it can also build great things like a real estate portfolio. Every yes. good real estate investor is using debt to leverage their purchasing power because, uh, because you can buy more, you can get more, and you're still getting all of the appreciation. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. one last counter argument before we wrap this up is the non-debt gurus out there, and I love Dave Ramsey, he does a fantastic job helping millions of Americans, he's helped me. But in this situation, how much risk are we really taking? We put down 40%. I mean, if this property even went down 10% in value, 20% in value, you can still sell it tomorrow and pay off the debt if you had to. This is not a 0%, you know, uh, junk bond, uh, crappy mortgage loan that got us into the debt crisis of the 2007 and 8 crash. This is a well thought out strategic loan where 
you're not, you're, this is a non-recourse loan. Your, your credit's not even on the line. And that's why banks are willing to loan this because you put down so much money, they know they're protected. They would love you to yep. default. They want the property back from you. So yeah. this is, this is, so Matt, leveraging an IRA, do you endorse this? What do you think? It's okay? I'm for it. Um, I signed the petition. <laughs> um, I vote in favor. Okay. I, you know, whatever. I, I, whatever vote's being taken, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> so this is, this is exciting. And I just want to challenge all of you out there. If you're not listening regularly to the Directed IRA podcast, please do so because this strategy of using leverage to get a better rate of return, to use your money wisely and carefully is doable. We go through the pod, in the podcast, the prohibited transactions, the functionality of an LLC, how to get around UDFI. Folks, this is a win, 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 IRS lose strategy every day of the weekend on Sunday. Yeah. And, drop. and I love the math because people love to give the simple answer and love like a sexy little, you know, don't do this. And I know, and they don't give you the details. They don't show their work, you know, like my, you know, my fifth grade math teacher that hated me because I wouldn't show my work, you know? Mm. So what if I, my friend sitting next to me had all the right answers and I just wrote them in? Well, show your work. And sometimes it's the guru saying what the other guru said that the other guru said, and no one freaking did the work to figure it out. What's better. We've just shown you the work. Just the okay. Work. I got one last tip though. Okay. There's still, we still got to talk about the stole. Okay. All right. Well, there's more good news because there's another solution to getting out of UDFI and that is using a solo 401k. So employer based plans, which includes the solo K have an exemption from this UDFI tax on leveraged real property. Now it's specific to buying real estate and leveraged real property. But if I use a solo K or any other 401k to buy real estate and I get debt, it's exempt from UDFI. That's pretty sweet. You don't have to do the yeah. math. I mean, it's just win-win. I get a benefit of the leverage. I don't even need to look if there's UDFI. Case closed. Now, does the exemption apply in a SEP or a simple? No, unfortunately okay. not. SEP and simples, even though they could be used in employer plans, don't apply. It's basically 401ks, pension plans. But the most common of ours is a solo 401k. We have lots of clients that are self-employed with no employees that use a solo K. Many of them are real estate clients. In fact, one of the most common clients we have is a real estate investor or a real estate agent that likes to do real estate deals with their retirement account. They don't have any other employees. Maybe they have some 1099 contractors, but no employees. They love the solo K. Okay. They can invest in the stuff they know. They can use debt, no UDFI. Okay. Now, Matt, that's all fine and good, but I already own a rental in my IRA. And <laughs> so... I can't do this then. I can't set up a solo 401k and use this strategy. Well, if it's a traditional IRA, we can do it. If you oh. qualify for a solo K. Okay. Yeah. What's the strategy? I can do this with a rental I already own in my IRA. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Walk <laughs> us through it. How do you do it? I feel like I'm like the uh, guy that came on the infomercial and you're like, I the know. Hype. you're like the hype lady. <laughs> like, I'm like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, and you really use that cream every day and you look so young. Can you show mm -hmm. us how you apply? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, I was setting you up for a slam dunk. That was the alley. I know. I love it. I love okay. it. Not, I mean, I'm not saying not to do it. That's, that's oh, okay. Just keep, keep, keep doing it. Actually. Just calling, <laughs> calling the kettle black. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if you've got an IRA that's got a property leveraged, you could get it over into a 401k. In fact, the easiest is if you had an IRA LLC. Because then the LLC still owns the property. You don't even need to change the deed. The loan is to the LLC. Don't need to change anything with the loan. We can do an in-kind transfer of the IRA ownership. Again, if it's traditional IRA or even SEP or simple, but traditional dollars over to your solo K account. It'll be owned in your traditional account in your solo K. Then don't sell it. Wait 12 months because <laughs> we want it in the solo K for 12 months. Mm. Then you could sell it and have no UDFI. I used to teach that you just sell it on day two but yeah. you still have to wait the 12 months to sell it. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, uh, well, actually, I think you're right. You're right. Cause you don't even have to look at the 12 month window. Yeah, I don't have to file a 990 T. Yeah, you're right. <gasps> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Cause you're right. Yeah. Woof. <laughs> wow. I was like feeling like, okay, I better correct my prior video. <laughs> this is great. I'm, I'm, 
rarely, folks, you want to mark the date and time in the universe that Mark was right because Matt's <laughs> usually always right and I'm having to keep up. So, no, that's good. That's good. So you could, if you've got a closing coming down the pipe, you could set up a solo 401k, not even make a contribution to it yet. Maybe you don't, yeah. but you set up, you have to have any sort of side hustle, which 45% of Americans have now. So you have a little <laughs> side hustle. You set up a solo 401k, move the traditional IRA into it, sell your rental, pay no UDFI, and then you can decide what to do with the money in the 401k. And yeah, that's great. Okay. Love that. Great idea. Well, Matt, a great show, if I may say so myself, leveraging yeah. your retirement account with real yeah. estate. I thought the best part was your math. I mean, I have to say, I've never thought, you know, the best part of any podcast would ever be the math part, but <laughs> you pulled that off today. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, that's fun. It's fun to see how leverage really does impact your return on investment and especially yeah. cash on cash. When people go, well, I'm going to get a rate of return on my tax savings and a rate of return on my appreciation, a rate of return. Just look at the cash. Just follow yeah. the cash. Yep. How much cash do you put in your pocket at the end of the day? Divide it by your yep. investment. It's more. <laughs> <laughs> Easy schmeasy. So, well, thanks, Suzanne. Yeah. Well, everybody, thanks Love for it. listening. Matt brought us in. I'll take us out. Mark your calendar. If you have not already booked your trip to Southern California later this month in April, and I'm going to give you the dates yeah, again. 21st and 22nd. April 21st and 22nd. Okay. And if you don't want to come down to Southern California, and who doesn't in April? It's just gorgeous. You can... You can uh, pay for now reserve your spot on the virtual ticket so we're going to be virtually broadcasting a day and a half of content if you miss a part of it it's recorded you'll be able to watch the recording but right now is the time to uh, get that on your calendar april 21st yep. and 22nd if you're self-directing your retirement account you got to be there or watch the recording mm -hmm. and the there's you, 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 yeah, there's so much to learn, so much whether content. you're new to it or you're experienced and you've been doing it for years or you've been to a prior summit. We're always learning new things, too, and teaching that. So get over to SDIRA Summit, SDIRA Summit com, where you can register and love to see you there. Yeah. Plus, we got two awesome networking receptions. Both nights, we're doing a cocktail party networking reception. I don't know. Mark, Mike, DJ one. I'll DJ the other. We'll see. Yeah. Wicka, wicka, wicka. I really get to DJ? Okay, I'm in. Yeah, one night okay All right. <laughs> one night. i get a, a turntable with some vinyl all right i'm there you gotta bring your own turntable you gotta be a, if you're gonna be dj you gotta you know show up with you show gear. up with your gear okay all right i'll bring it i'll bring it all right see everybody thanks everybody.